Buddhism was successfully spread throughout most of China not through the efforts of Fo Tu Deng alone. Another essential figure within this rising Buddhist movement was Grand Master Kumara Jiva. Born in 334 in Kucha, in the Xinjiang province near India, Kumara Jiva grew up in a devout Buddhist family. His father, Kumarayana, hailed from a Kashmiri Brahmin noble lineage. However, Kumara Jiva's father renounced his wealth and nobility in order to become a Buddhist monk and spread the teachings of Buddha. Kumarayana attempted to spread Buddhism throughout all of China, but never achieved this goal. He was stopped in Kucha, where the king, who greatly respected his wisdom and prominence, gave him the position of the royal priest. The Kuchin king introduced Kumarayana to the wisest person in Kucha, his sister Javaka. Kumarayana and Javaka immediately fell in love with one another and carried on their Buddhist teachings in Kucha. Kumara Jiva was guided and heavily influenced by his mother during his early studies. When he was seven, his mother joined a Sioli nunnery in northern Kucha. Following in the footsteps of his mother, Kumara Jiva committed countless numbers of Texas sutras to his memory. At the nunnery, Kumara Jiva began to learn Abhidharma, when he, and when he turned nine, he and his mother traveled to Kashmir to continue his Buddhist education. When Kumara Jiva turned 12, he traveled to Turpan, in a northeastern area of Kucha, and was the home of over 10,000 monks. There, Kumara Jiva was taught early Mahayana texts by the master Sri Asoma, and soon began an intensive study of Madhyakama texts, such as the works of Nagarjuna, an eminent Buddhist philosopher. At such a young age, Kumara Jiva had become extremely well-versed with these Buddhist texts. His unprecedented wisdom and prowess would soon lead him to become one of the most important figures in the spread of Buddhism in China. When Kumara Jiva turned 20, he was personally asked to return to Kucha by the Kuchin king Po Shui. There, Kumara Jiva was fully ordained at the king's palace and lived comfortably in a new monastery built for him. Kumara Jiva continued his Buddhist studies, while at the same time teaching Buddhism to the masses. In 379, a Chinese Buddhist monk named Sang Jun visited Kucha where he saw firsthand Kumara Jiva's abilities. Sangjun brought this information back to the Qin court, and a Chinese emperor Fu Jian called for Kumara Jiva to be brought to China. He sent his general Lu Guang with an army to conquer Kucha and to escort Kumara Jiva back to China. Misfortune befell Fu Jian, as his main Lu army Lu Guang, defeated the capital army, of but no emperor, became the ruler of his own state in 386. He captured Kumara Jiva, who is now 40, and imprisoned him for many years. It is during this time in captivity that Kumara Jiva learned and familiarized himself with the Chinese language, which would soon prove itself to be tremendously valuable. The new emperor Yao Xing repeatedly pleaded for Lu Guan to release Kumara Jiva to Tang'an. When the warlord refused time and again, Yao Xing dispatched his armies to defeat Lu Guang and retrieve Kumara Jiva. In 401, Kumara Jiva was saved from his captivity and brought to Tang'an. There, his expansive expertise of Buddhism and familiarity with the Chinese language made him an indispensable asset to Yao Xing's court. Upon his arrival, Kumara Jiva was immediately introduced to the emperor and the Buddhist leaders of China. Many of them considered him to be a great master from the West, and he was given the title of national teacher, a great achievement within the Buddhist circles. Even Emperor Yao Xing himself looked upon Kumara Jiva as a personal teacher, and Kumara Jiva held major influence over the emperor's decisions. Through direct teachings and translations, Kumara Jiva pushed Buddhism to even more prominent heights within imperial China's royalty. At the behest of Emperor Yao Xing, Kumara Jiva translated a large number of Buddhist sutras into Chinese. These translations not only set the bar for future translations of Buddhist texts, but completely revolutionized Chinese Buddhism at the time. Kumara Jiva's translation style not only conveyed clarity, but managed to replace the old Geyi system of translations as well. Geyi was a 3rd century Chinese Buddhist method of translation, through which terms from Sanskrit Buddhism would be matched roughly to its similar concept in Chinese classics. This created unclear translations to Buddhism, as a Buddhist term will be translated through Confucian or Taoist lenses, thus muddling the original idea the text was attempting to convey. Instead of using Geyi to achieve precise literal translations, Kumara Jiva tended to write a smooth flow that focused more on the meaning of texts. Kumara Jiva translated thousands of texts, but of those, his most important translations were the Vajrakadika Pranaparamita Sutra, or the Diamond Sutra, the Siddharma Pundarika Sutra, or the Lotus Sutra, and the Amitabha Sutra. The Diamond Sutra had never been translated into Chinese until Kumara Jiva accomplished a task in 401. Although numerous translations of the Diamond Sutra occurred after Kumara Jiva, it was his translation that was the most well received during that time. In fact, Kumara Jiva's translation of the Diamond Sutra is one of, that is found on the Dunhuang Scroll, which dates back to 868, 400 years after Kumara Jiva completed his translation. The Lotus Sutra was one of the most popular and influential of the Mahayana Sutras, and was the discourse delivered by Buddha near the end of his life. 
However, Kumar Jiva was not the first to translate it into Chinese. In 286, the Lotus Sutra was translated from Sanskrit to Chinese by Tsufa Hu in Chang'an during the Jin period. In 406, Kumar Jiva's translation superseded that of Tsufa Hu's, and because of its popularity, caused Buddhism to be even more widespread throughout Asia. The Amitabha Sutra, the primary sutra that upholds the school of Pure Land Buddhism, was also first translated into Chinese by Kumar Jiva in 402. Because of the success of Kumar Jiva's translations, the Amitabha Sutra gained popularity amongst Pure Land and Chan Buddhism in China and influenced the Jodoshu and Jodo Shinshu schools of Buddhism in Japan. Because of his expansive knowledge and well-received translations, Kumara Jiva stayed in the very good graces of the emperor. Yao Tseng built hundreds of Buddhist monasteries and temples, all with places where Kumara Jiva and his disciples could translate Sanskrit Buddhist sutras into Chinese. It was said that even the emperor himself would participate in the translations. From 401 to 413, Kumara Jiva managed to translate 74 scriptures in 384 fascicles in total. Within such a short period of time, Kumar Jiva and his team of translators managed to present Mahayana Buddhism to China with a far greater clarity and precision than ever before. He had managed to separate the teachings of Buddhism from the mysticism of Taoism and cemented Buddhism as a major religion within China. Before his death, Kumar Jiva stated that if his translations managed to capture the true meaning of Buddhism and stay in accordance to genuine Buddhist principles, his tongue would remain intact after his cremation. His tongue was, in fact, the only part of him remaining within his ashes.